Amen. Amen. Always wonderful to start off with our national anthem, which is a prayer, and also our national song. We want to welcome everyone uh, who has joined us since the opening welcome to this very special occasion. Uh, we hope and expect that others will be joining us as we go along. And uh, we know we will not uh, have as much time as we would need this evening to go through all that we would like to go through. So I can put it out that there's very likely going to be a part two. But um, at this time, I going to ask us to quiet our hearts as we invite Elder Christopher Duval to open in prayer for us. Yes, amen. <clears throat> Father Lord, we thank you that you always invite us to meet with you and your promise that we are two or three of us are gathered. There you will be with us in the midst. So we are happy to know that you were the first to join in this meeting today. And Lord, that you have not been left out of our deliberations at all. So now, Lord, as we put ourselves before you, we humbly ask for your wisdom, for your guidance, and for understanding. Lord, never many times the issues that concern the way how the world runs will leave us in confusion, leave us in despair, and sometimes will give us hope that it is not there. But Father Lord, never we know that you have the wisdom to, to teach us. And uh, because the, 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 there are many other plans in the heart of the king, but you will control it all. Lord, never we know that you are in control. Even when it seems like it is a time of chaos, we know that you are in control and you are working out everything according to your plan. Never, 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 nevertheless, you have encouraged us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and you have encouraged us that we should stand in the gap for our nation. So Lord, never, you have asked us to pray that the peace will reign and that we will have good government and that we will be able to pursue worship and evangelization in peace. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have preserved these things for us in our nation. 
and we pray, Lord, that we will do no nothing, nor will we to, to, to jeopardize this, nor, nor will we uh, be, be, be uh, forgetful or, 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 or uh, nor will we uh, not stand when we should be standing. For it is a bad thing the, to not act when we should. And so, dear Father, we pray you help us not to forsake our responsibilities, but to stand when we ought to, and having done all to stand. Lord, then we pray that you will give the speaker the, 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 the wisdom to pull from the, the legalese all the things that are important for us to understand. That we may know where we stand in you, where we stand in the government, where we stand in the in the country, and what are our rights and our responsibilities. Father, then we thank you that we are not put here to look out for our own, uh, but that we should also watch out for our neighbor. And we are thanking you, Lord, in heaven, that you have given us the opportunity to not only uh, spread healing and, and, and health within our ranks, but that we can reach out to others and give good counsel and, and, and bless those who are needed and necessary. So uh, with, with, with your word, with, with your healing, and with your time of, uh, 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 of, 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 of uh, your your wisdom, you know, your Lord, we cannot only rely on common sense, and so we seek to educate ourselves with these things that are necessary now. Father, Lord, we thank you for your mercy, for your grace, and we pray, O oh Lord, that you will bless our meeting today. For we ask it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. 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 Amen, 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 amen. Thank you so much, Elder Dr. Christopher Duvall. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a presentation on Kingdom Principles and the Jamaican Constitution, a mature church's wise application and contemporary interpretation within a legal framework. Seems to be quite loaded. But considering that which we want to really grasp, we have a very competent person with us this evening to break that down. We have our guest presenter, none other than the host of the Morning Connection. Uh, and uh, I will be introducing her a little bit more in a short while. But I want you to stand by as we prepare ourselves to be informed and uh, be equipped for this assignment that we have. We are celebrating our Jamaica 60 you know, Diamond Jubilee, and uh, we have been blessed to review, to reflect on where we are coming from and uh, to contemplate where we are and to envision where we want to go. We have certainly a good sense of what this nation has been called to do. We recite it very often in our pledge. We believe we have a role to advance the welfare of the whole human race. And we believe that is a God design and a God intended goal and vision for us. Our theme for this year is reigniting a nation for greatness. And I believe greatness is the prerogative of the divine because only he alone is great. Surely the scripture reminds us that he's a great God and a great king above all gods. So if it is the prerogative of God himself and the nation calls for greatness, which God really intended to have each nation experience greatness, then it is uh, fitting that we understand that it's the people of God 
who have a responsibility, therefore, to answer to this desire for the that the nation has asked for. And uh, we are answering that call. And we believe that no more than ever is such a time to do that. And it is quite fitting, therefore, that we consider a little bit about the roots of our genesis. Uh, yes, from the very beginning in 1962, when the Constitution was formed, and it would have become the bedrock upon which this nation would have grown. I want us to just reflect a little bit of what that meant for us and what it therefore means as we move forward with that as the foundation. I want to share with you a part of the speech of one of our founding fathers, one who was involved in the drafting of the constitution and in fact was uh, the first premier of Jamaica, the right excellent Norman Washington Manley, who is also a national hero, who was the leader and the chair of that commission that drafted our constitution. At the end of his tenure, he gave in his last public address at an annual conference of the PNP, he said, I say that the mission of my generation was to win self-government for Jamaica, to win political power, which is the final power for the black masses of my country from which I spring. I am proud to stand here today and say to you who fought that fight with me, Speak with gladness and pride. Mission accomplished for my generation. And what is the mission of this generation? It is reconstructing the social and economic society and life of Jamaica. Norman Manley, who passed away not too long after on September 2, 1969. What a powerful speech one who knew what their mission was and accomplished that mission and set the next generation on their mission. Well, we're a little bit less than 60 years after that time when he said that, which was in 1969. And the question is, have this generation accomplished that mission? Here to discuss further as it relates to the kingdom principle and the Jamaican constitution is one who is quite fitted to do so. She, as I said before, is a host of the Morning Connection and Best 100 FM. She's a legal consultant and business strategy advisor, telecommunications regulation and policy advisor to both public and private sector entities, and has worked as litigation practitioner for over 20 years before transitioning to consultancy and advisory practice. She is one of us. She's a child of the king, and she is a part of the household of faith. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to welcome none other than our guest presenter for this evening, Minette Lawrence. Thank you, Pastor Edwards. I must remember that introduction. If it could be um, patented and replayed, I would ask that anyone who has to introduce me be sure to mention that I am a child of the kingdom and a fellow believer. Because I think of all the things that may be said about me in time to come, that is by far the most important and the one that I cherish the most. It has been quite a journey to this point of my life, point of my life. I, I'm hearing myself speak, which is never the best thing for me. There is an echo of some sort. All right, I think um, the, that might have gone. Thank you very much. Um, it is really a pleasure to speak on this particular topic. It has been one of the driving passions of my life to be able to become a part of the voices, one of the voices that would speak truth to power and more, importantly, and more importantly, to be a part of the team that equips the children of faith, equips the saints for their work in the marketplace. Um, the Constitution of Jamaica 
is the preeminent covenant under which we stand beside each other as citizens of this country. Um, in, I, I should say, and I hope he is um, online with us, that I have the great pleasure and honor of sharing the hosting of the Morning Connection with Pastor Percival, one of your own brothers in, in the house where you serve. And aside from the, I would say the shock value of having a lawyer and a pastor speak on matters of the kingdom, I think both Pastor Percival and myself have been transformed over the last year in our understanding of how this covenant works and especially the extent to which citizens, persons who are under the covenant have an incomplete understanding of what it requires of us and what it ought to be delivering to us. So I'm gonna speak about the constitution in two voices. There will be the spiritual undertone or overtone at all times because it is a living, breathing document that has life and spirit within it. And I will speak in the voice of uh, a lawyer a natural, a person who is operating in the natural realm and seeking to gain understanding and convey information on something that is very mundane and practical. My hope is that you will be able to wear your two hats of, in a similar vein and walk with me as we look at the constitutional arrangements, the covenant under which we stand in the island of Jamaica, whilst at the same time, being children of the kingdom of God, who have the primary responsibility of ushering in the kingdom. And as clergymen, yourselves being in the church family, you have the even more awesome responsibility of equipping the saints for work in the marketplace so that we can all mature together to be what we desire to be, which is children of the most high God. I'm going to start by looking at what we did in 2011 um, taking my, my launching pad from what Pastor Jason just said, referring to the parting words of our first premier when they declared the mission accomplished in seeing Jamaica emerge from the control of the monarchy to become a con have a constitution and to be involved in self-representation at the political level. I too. In, in recent times, as we went through the celebration of independence and emancipation, I too took a look at what it was that um, Sir Alexander Bustamante said. He had, by that time, he was our first prime minister, as you all know, and what um, Mr. Manley himself said as leader of the opposition at the time. Um, Mr. Bustamante was focusing on the agreement and the graciousness of the queen in permitting us to, to depart her rulership with a document in place, which I must say is more than England itself has to this day. You should know that England has no written constitution. Um, Mr. Manley instead looked at what it was that he hoped for the nation. So I have to um, commend the Holy Spirit for giving Pastor Edwards and myself the same starting point. Mr. Manley at the time had one simple wish, he wanted Jamaica to be a safe place for Jamaicans to live and become and raise their families. That's all he wanted, a safe place while we are in control of our own affairs. Could we make it a safe place for our families to grow? So how do we move from uh, the rulership of a monarchy, which is unlike a theocracy, a single monarch or a family of royals who had full control of our affairs and move now into a place of autonomy and what we dare hope to be independence. I've often criticized Jamaica's constitution for being so inadequate as not even to make mention of the aspirations of a people who were now leaving the plantation to set up their own government. There's no mention of the 90 odd percent of Africans who at the time made up the body politic. There's no mention of our struggle. There's no mention of our hopes for the future. In fact, our constitution, which is described as an order in council, meaning whilst the queen was in, in session with her counselors, an order was made 
which relieved her of the responsibility for Jamaica among some other, I think it's the East Atlantic um, territories, including other Caribbean islands. And I think um, she was just getting rid of um, a batch of, of countries which it was no longer convenient nor fiscally prudent for her to own. It is not how any of us would wish to be born. Really, we got our independence. Our independence was sort of a side wind. If the queen gets rid of you, takes you off her budget, then you can claim it to be an independent. Um, you can claim to be an independent nation. Um, they, but as both political giants of the day saw it, we had at least got away by whatever means necessary, we had got away. But the condition of our constitution was such that having got away, it then fell to us to ensure that the people we wished to become would be appropriately documented in the instrument which is at the foundation of our independence. Now, what we have come to recognize as the fundamental rights and freedoms never did enter the constitutional arrangements until 2011. In, it was only in 2011 that Jamaica amended its constitution to incorporate specific protections for the fundamental rights and freedoms of all persons in Jamaica. The word fundamental is there deliberately. It is because those rights and freedoms are at the base of our existence as free citizens. In America, they're called inalienable rights, meaning they cannot be separated from your person. If you exist, you have these rights. And you will see even as the Americans debate Roe versus Wade, they are traveling back as far as they can into the womb to identify the moment when you begin to have those rights. Some states say those rights crystallize if you are 15 weeks in utero. Some say it is only after you reach a certain stage. Whatever the case may be, the world is at a point in their understanding of law and human rights where they are recognizing that those rights exist from the moment when life can be recognized as being viable. Jamaica itself has signed up to various um, international treaty and um, commitments which signal that the rights of a child do begin in utero and those rights are so preeminent that they may operate to curtail the rights of the pregnant mother. So there are some conditions which we now recognize but have not done the necessary domestic um, legal reform, work of legal reform to incorporate them into the incorporate them into the constitutional arrangements. But when you look at our constitution, you will see that the rights of the child actually begin while you are in utero. I have used the word covenant to describe our constitution because I want all of us as persons of faith to recognize that the constitution is the mirror image of the covenant which we fall under as believers in God, as persons of faith. This charter of human rights, fundamental rights, was the result of extensive public and parliamentary consultations and deliberations that, is over, um, that took place over about two decades and it is more than a decade old at this time. It elevated the long-standing common law rights and precedent-based interpretation of human rights to statutory rights rights that are now enshrined in clear yeah. prescriptive yeah. language. Yeah. Is it the one, the, the one where they would have looked too much? Yeah. Mm. All right. I'm hearing someone speak. I think mics are not all muted. All right, that seems to have ended. Okay, the elected officials who sit in parliament are the ones responsible for passing laws and administering public life. And they are prohibited by section 13 to be of the charter from passing any law or taking any action which abrogates, abridges or infringes those rights. The only caveat to this prohibition is that guaranteed rights and freedoms may be infringed where it is demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. All of this means that 
as an independent nation, Jamaica has switched its allegiance from the supremacy of the monarch's rule, meaning whatever the queen said was law and had immediate effect and was binding on all her subjects. We moved from the supremacy of the monarch's rule to the supremacy of the rule of law. As people of faith, you do understand that there is an order to things which is established by divine ordinance. And we in the church community understand hierarchy and levels and the chain of command and submission. So it is in the natural world. In the natural world, if you have removed the monarch, you must replace her with something. And it is the concept of the rule of law which has replaced the queen as the single point of reference. I've created a pyramid with my fingers to show that there is an apex at the top was the queen. When she was removed, we replaced her with a constitutional arrangement which gave supremacy to the rule of law. And the law is as made, passed in parliament by those whom we elect and give the authority to make these laws for us. And so the glue that binds us under the covenant is this belief that the law, as we declare it, is supreme. What is meant by the supremacy of the rule of law? Simply put, it means that both citizen and state are governed by the same laws in a manner that affords quality of treatment and access. The law itself must be derived from a democratic process which represents the will of the majority whilst protecting the minority. There are other systems of governance which do not give supremacy to the rule of law. These are authoritarian systems where the, the, the power is reserved in the hands of a small group or a single person, or you have dictatorships, just to give you the framework for a comparison. But in Jamaica, we have gone with the rule of law. And under the rule of law, there is a process, which is a democratic process for making these laws. Whose law is supreme? I ask that and so should you. Is it the kingdom of man or the kingdom of God? Clearly under the kingdom of man, in the kingdom of man, the supremacy of the rule of law is bound to the constitution and the power of the parliament to make laws. Under the, in the kingdom of God, we know it is a theocratic rule which, which emanates from the character and the presence of God within the lives of his people. Under this dispensation, the kingdom of God starts for us with a relationship between believer and, and Christ. Christ being the fulfillment of the law and it is he who sets us free through our knowledge of him. The son of God is believed to be the complete embodiment of the letter and spirit of the law. That singular truth, which if known would deliver us freedom, a freedom that man has pursued since the dawn of time. And scripture records that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. This is from the book of John chapter eight, verse 32. And again at verse 36, he says, whom the son sets free is free indeed. So we have fundamental rights and freedoms recognized and um, documented in our charter of, of rights under our constitution, that is our covenant. And then we have another set of, in fact, we have freedom, which is derived directly from our relationship with God. And that is the, 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 the freedom which sets us free. The freedom which we get from our faith is reflected in our liberation from the bondage of sin and the systems of the world, as well as the removal of all inhibitions that would prevent us from entering into the abundant life that is the promise conveyed by the covenant between God and his image bearers who walk by faith. So clearly I have to mention the freedom that we get under our constitution. The freedom that we got under our constitution was freedom from enslavement by the queen because we were chattel slaves. That is the liberation which we got. Did it give us the freedom or the autonomy or the means by which we could enter into an abundant life, it did not. That is clear. Despite um, the wishes that Jamaica could now move into creating a safe place, 
We have not created a safe place because we have not had the means to do so. We have not been able to raise families in a peaceful environment because we have not had the means to do so. So when we look at the freedom which is desirable and the freedom in which we choose to stand, it is clear that we need to be aligned with the principles of the kingdom of God in order to have that abundant life. I thought I would just make note of some of these principles just to anchor us. Most of you know what he said, I think is in the Psalm. I wish Pastor Percival loves to recite it for me. Um, the principles, the kingdom, the throne of God is established on righteousness, justice, and the truth. So we know that these are the principles which if we can apply those in our daily living, in our political life, in our economic life, in our social movements about town, we can enter into the abundant life because those principles guarantee us a response from the maker of the covenant under which we fall. Even if you go as far back as the Abrahamic covenant, it is offering you the same thing. Maintaining the supremacy of God's law requires a level of commitment. I've called it Samsonite commitment. We have to be committed to fight to the death, even if it means that we die with the Philistines. That was the declaration that Samson made in Judges 16 verse 28. He said, give me the strength one more time and let me die with my enemy, essentially is what he said. Do we dare to do that? Because that is the call which is upon the church in today's society. We must be prepared to exercise that freedom to die in defense of our faith, of our beliefs. And that to me is the ultimate expression of this liberation. Preferring the supremacy of human law leads to perpetuation of the same systems of abuse and injustice. And here I mentioned the Levites concubine coming out of the book of Judges chapter 19, 21 to 25. You may recall that almost every tale in that narrative ends with these words. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. When we are subscribing only to the law as established by man and forgetting the law which emanates from the throne of God, we run into trouble. So law without the spirit of righteousness will not deliver justice and will only frustrate citizens with its unfruitfulness. And here I remind you that it is the law which prescribes death, but the spirit gives life. What the law does is to mandate the punishment for breaking it. The law identifies this sin. It is because of law that we know sin. It is because of law that we know crime. All of the thou shalt not. Every instrument that is set up by parliament, which is to order us in a particular path, it begins by criminalizing some kind of conduct and it prescribes a punishment. I, here I remind anyone who listens to my lectures will know that there is a point at which I always say that man was born with the freedom to do anything and everything. That is the essential freedom that you have to choose to go left or right, good or bad, up or down. And as society sought to structure itself, it began to place limitations on those rights. Some limitations are necessary for public health to maintain even your own safety. But really, if you got up today and formed it in your intention to kill your neighbor, you can do it. And many have done it. If you get up today with the intention to be a blessing to your neighbor, you can do it. And many have done it. As society has evolved over time, we began to make more and more laws. But laws exist to show you what is wrong. Doesn't exist to show you what is right. No one makes a law to say what is right. They make a law to identify what is unacceptable and to name the consequence for it. And that is the foundation of the scripture which tells you that the law is death and the spirit gives life. I'm spending some time on this because I have found in most of the presentations that I do, that if I get this foundation right, then everyone, whether they have studied law or not, can pick up a piece of legislation or can look at a situation and immediately begin to understand the principles through which they must interpret and form a response. So understanding the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law is as important in the study of law in the natural world as it is in the study of law in the spiritual world. 
The letter of the law is distinct from the spirit of the law. The letter is what the law states in plain language must be done or not done. The spirit of the law is the social and moral consensus on the interpretation and purpose of the law. Obedience to the spirit of the law requires more than mere acts of physical compliance. It requires an attitude of the mind. Circumcision of the heart is perhaps the best description which I am borrowing from the Apostle Paul when he spoke about the renewal of the mind. It also requires us to be sensitive to the ways of the world when Christ himself said he's sending his disciples out as sheep in the midst of wolves, requiring us to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. It is telling you that even your own concept of righteousness or sin, uh, those concepts are subject to review because you may be required to exercise the, the, the wisdom of a serpent, but you are not a serpent. And you are meant to be as innocent as doves, but you must still be conscious of the wiles, the systems, the schemes of the devil, or the schemes of the world which are set up to throw you off purpose. But comes the good part, and I have to mention it because it has worked for me so many times. When you are arrested, do not worry. The spirit of your father will speak through you. So we, in our understanding and our defense of the principles of the kingdom, must develop the boldness and the fearlessness to offer resistance, to agitate for change without being overly concerned on how you are going to make your case or defend your position. What I and the purpose of this presentation, this presentation this evening is to encourage you to be bold and to be fearless and to be proactive in the defense of these kingdom principles and the laws that must be preserved in order for the kingdom of God to come into reality. There are some gifts which were given to the church. Ephesians 4, 11 to 12, even up to 13 speak of them. Gifts were given to the church in the form of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Tonight I'm wearing the hat, or this afternoon I'm wearing the hat of teacher. And the whole purpose of these gifts was to equip the saints for works of ministry and to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God as we mature to the full measure of the stature of Christ. The freedom we enjoy is to bring us into the manifested manifestation or the representative status of Christ. That's where we aim to go and why we must be aware of these things and take the right position. We must put on the full armor of God, the sword of the spirit, belt of truth, shield of faith. Those are necessary gear in these times. And this session is meant to equip you with a word of truth appropriate to the events of this season. I'm going to start my deep dive into the Constitution now by looking at what we have just gone through. Um, the Disaster Risk Management Act was at the center of much of what transpired over the last two years. And I'm, I'm framing some of my analysis through that piece of legislation because it was sort of like a, you know, they talk about gateway drugs. It was a tester. It opened up certain issues on the back of which a number of things have followed. And perhaps had we been more discerning when this was taking place under the pandemic arrangements, we may have forestalled a few things, but not to worry, we worship a God who can expand or contract time as needed so that his children can be in the right place at the right time. The COVID-19 pandemic was declared a national disaster affecting the entire island of Jamaica. It gave enormous latitude to the government by suspending the effect of the constitution in several important respects. The Disaster Risk Management Act is not itself unconstitutional by mere reason of this power that it conferred on government officials to curtail the rights and freedoms of citizens. Now, re no, remember, I describe these rights as inalienable oh, or yeah. fundamental, which means that any interference with <laughs> ask you to send must, me something, and I also needed to look at something must take place within a particular context. There is, of course justification for some curtailment of individual liberties. That's why I said it on the chair. 
when the freedom, when the society is itself at risk. The one in here. Of contagion. I don't know if there's a way to mute all microphones, but if there is, please, um, Pastor Edwards, engage it for me. Some. Me. <laughs> all right. Thank you. I appreciate it. So under the Disaster Risk Management Act, the, its most significant impact was the suspension of constitutionally guaranteed rights. The Constitution, as I've said, is the primary covenant under which all social, economic, and political rights and obligations are arranged. Covenants are not just promises. They are agreements between parties with promises and limitations. They are intergenerational in that they run with the genus or type of the maker and are binding on all parties. So if it's a covenant made with man, then the children of man are covered from generation to generation. It does not require each generation to separately sign on to the covenant. The covenant remains binding on mankind. A covenant that binds land, for example, will run with land irrespective of a change of ownership. Most of you have seen advertisements in the paper for a change of restrictive covenants. These are covenants that actually run with the land and they cannot be breached or removed without a particular process being followed. That's unlike easements. Easements are rights of ways that are done by contract between parties and they are binding on the parties only. And an easement can be um, binding on one owner, but not binding on the other. That's just a little understanding about covenants. If a covenant is on land, it runs with the land. A covenant is on man, it runs with man, the species of man. Covenant on animals, it runs with animals. On the environment, it covers the environment. There are covenants which God has made in respect of the environment. So you will know from scripture that if innocent blood is shed on a land, it has a consequence. It does not matter whether it was shed by the person who currently owns the land. And so you will see that there are some places in Jamaica that don't seem to prosper. There's a place called no man's land that remains no man's land, blighted, parched. There is a covenant concerning innocent blood that was breached. And until the repair is done, that land is going to remain as it is. And these are just important things for persons of faith to know, especially when we want to do social intervention projects. We must know that the root of a blight lies in a covenant that has been dishonored. We have to understand what covenant so we can take the necessary steps to effect the repair. So there are covenants that concern land, that concern people, that concern um, every realm that our Father in heaven has created. All covenants originate with or are ordained by God, who, because he is unchanging, has caused covenants to be eternally binding. And you've heard him say that all power begins with him. If there is a government in power in your country, whether the government is good or bad, that power exists because God has deemed it to be fit and proper at this particular time for reasons which we may never understand. So. All covenants originate with or are ordained by God. The nature and form of the covenant determines how breaches and or modifications are handled. A covenant cannot be left by one party only. You can walk away from the covenant. All parties must leave the covenant together by agreement. That is why in respect of our constitution, you hear the continuing debate about entrenched clauses can we leave the Privy Council? Yes, we can. That is not an entrenched provision. Can we become a republic? No, we cannot simply by requiring it to be so. If we are coming out of the covenant under the constitution, we need to take some steps which may be quite radical. So for example, um, constitutional covenants can be breached by war, severe act of hostility, tear it up, throw it away, but it happens through a, an act of hostility. If you are moving in agreement, if you are moving in a democratic way, then you have to observe the process which underpins the covenant. 
During the pandemic, government was authorized through the Office of Disaster Preparedness to assess, coordinate, and implement plans for public health and safety in the event of a disaster. Restrictions of movement and on the liberty of the person could be justifiably imposed during such periods of public emergency. The states of emergency provisions and the introduction of zones of special operations in various communities and parishes are currently examples of the use of this power. Now, what you have to consider is when the government decides to suspend the rights of some individuals in order to protect the rights of others, persons of faith must make the evaluation applying the principles of our kingdom of God. Is this righteous? Is this just to the persons who are inconvenienced? Because really what it means is that the government has taken a decision to prefer the liberty of some over the liberty of others. And if they are wrong in so doing, we then see cases emerge where persons are able to sue for wrongful imprisonment or breach of their constitutional rights. And then the entire country pays the cost of the damage which that person has incurred. And that's why it's important that we develop some understanding of what these rights are so that we can be a part of those who agitate for change if those rights are being abused. The Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms defines period of public disaster and period of public emergency as events requiring a proclamation by the governor general. This is because any interference in the enjoyment of covenant rights must be done by special agreement and with the informed consent of the beneficiaries, especially those who are going to be inconvenienced. Now, these are the entrenched rights. And it, as I said before, it does not include the right to using the Privy Council as a final court of appeal. That is not an entrenched right. That's just a benefit which lingered after independence. So, you know, you've heard former prime ministers debating, should it be by way of referendum and prime minister PJ Patterson being very clear in his explanation that even the Privy Council itself has already said, we don't need to use a referendum. So if, for example, the government of Jamaica got up today and says, we are going to the CCJ and a citizen wanted to protest and that protest went as high as the court of, as the Privy Council in, in the UK, we already know how they would rule. I just want to take a quick walk through the rights and freedoms that become affected when the constitution is suspended. Um, under the Disaster Risk Management Act, we saw freedom of movement was curtailed, freedom of association and peaceful assembly, freedom of religion and from discrimination on the ground of religion, the right to equitable and humane treatment by government agencies, liberty of the person, freedom of thought, speech, conscience and belief. These were all rights which were jeopardized by the operation of that particular piece of legislation. And if you notice, as I said, it was, uh, it, it was a way of opening the avenue to see, it was like testing, how far can we go? If we interfere with these rights, how are citizens going to respond, react? And I would say it has laid the foundation for future excesses and we've already seen some of them, which I will come to. Additionally, there were many free and democratic societies that instituted similar measures to address the pandemic. So what you saw was that the world was moving in the same direction and there becomes the inclination to say, well, it is happening elsewhere. Let's not make a fuss about it here. But I remind you that as persons of faith, we always go back to the principles of the kingdom, righteousness, justice, truth. The Constitutional Court of Jamaica has, however, set the parameters for evaluating the exercise of any state power in circumstances where curtailment of rights and freedoms is unavoidable. And here I would make mention of the case of Julian Robinson against the Attorney General. Most of you would know it as the NIDS case, National Identification System. The court ruled in that case that the curtailment or violation of rights and freedoms must be proportionate and go only so far as is necessary to achieve the legitimate objective. Here for the first time, the government or parliament is being given some instruction on how to approach 
the interference with those rights. You should go only so far as you need to go to achieve the legitimate objective. In the NIDS case, the court was saying, you don't need to get um, certain bio data in order to set up an identification system for citizens. You don't need retina scan and blood type and so on. It was enough that you already take fingerprints and it is enough that you have name and address and so on. And the, the court was there rather fearful that the government was going to associate certain um, benefits and rights to which citizens are entitled by mere, the mere fact that they stand under the covenant of the constitution, that the government would associate those rights with participation in that identification system. Um, we've seen where enforcement orders were promulgated under the Disaster Risk Management Act by the Prime Minister. And when he, in, when he introduced the first such order, it imposed a near total curtailment of movement. Subsequent orders reflected some consideration being given to restoring economic activity and protection of economic or property rights. Now, economic and property rights are constitutionally guaranteed rights. The right to education, the right to due process in the courts of law, access to medical care, and ensuring that transportation and energy sectors were operational. The efforts by the government in those regards were quite consistent with the duty that they have to ensure that they do not shut down and, and, and cause citizens to be completely left without any rights. There was a deliberate effort to ensure that some things continued. The right to freedom of association and peaceful assembly was nearly completely violated for some persons and for and a number of persons just had no opportunity at all to participate in group activities. There was a restriction on the size of gatherings and outright prohibition of gatherings on some holy days. I think Easter um, was shut down for one in one year. And this meant that citizens were being denied the opportunity to associate freely. In some instances, persons were restricted to worshiping online, regardless of their access to the technology that would facilitate it. Persons in that category were fully entitled to bring an action against the government for stripping them completely of these rights because the provision is that you go only so far as is necessary to achieve your legitimate objective. We see now that on a daily basis, I would say, government agencies are issuing or denying permits and licenses, which also have the effect of interfering with the enjoyment of this freedom. Many of the cases that go to court have to do with trade unions and workers wanting to preserve their right to associate in a union and the right to withdraw their labor or, or take strike action. Um, the peaceful assembly part of it, of course, is as long as you are not creating a disturbance to the peace, you are all entitled to congregate on the sidewalks, in the parks, wherever you choose to. So for example, when the UIC president sought to have a peaceful demonstration in the downtown area during the pandemic, it gave rise to those considerations when the police intervened and um, made certain and arrested some of the parties. Those events should stir the conscience as to whether the government had gone too far and what was the legitimate objective that they could be seen as pursuing. At the end of September 2022, we are expecting to see a full court or a constitutional court decision in a case that was brought by Mr. George Neal against the Attorney General. Mr. Neal is the person of whom the government said an adverse trace prevented him from participating with others in forming a telecommunications business. It is a case I know very well because the telecommunications business is a business of which I was a part. And in that case, the government of Jamaica sought to show that suspicions and rumors about a person which are documented in their police database was a sufficient ground on which they could prevent a citizen from doing business. Um, whether or not they are right in so holding is something that the court will speak on. But it is an important point 
because many of you may at some point seek to cause a civil disturbance as you profess your faith. And if you do, and that works its way into a computer database in the police's um, custody, you may find that for mysterious reasons, you cannot do certain things in the kingdom of man. And you may never know that it is because you came to the attention of the police. The police sought to explain that anyone who comes to their attention in a certain context, a report is, is filed away about them. And then at some point it is used, whether it is used because a, an international source wants to see it. But these are some of the issues that fall for consideration as we look at how state agencies operate towards citizens. Then there is the freedom of movement throughout Jamaica during the pandemic. There were many stay-at-home stay orders, curfew hours, and sometimes um, we were locked in completely. We could not go out. This gives rise to consideration about how the social and economic well-being of persons are maintained. Can you earn an income during curfew hours? Because several other incidental rights are affected when, cert when the government imposes a lockdown. We have seen already cases of state of emergency detainees who have succeeded in their claims against the government for damages because they were detained in various states of emergency, kept incarcerated without any trial, and later on they were simply released because there was no evidence against them. Now, that might be something which many persons in the comfort of their homes may regard it as a necessary action to keep violence producers off the street. But in effect, what is happening is that the rights of these citizens are being violated completely for the safety and protection of maybe you and me, because we might be living in communities that are made the subject of violent action by other communities. The equitable and humane treatment, there is an expectation that all citizens would receive equitable and humane treatment by any public authority in the exercise of their function. That is a constitutionally guaranteed right. And for this, I would say, consider the case of young Nzinga King, who whilst in the custody of the police was deprived of her locks, her locks being a significant aspect of the faith which she professed. While you are in the custody of the police, it is not expected that they would treat you in a certain way. Humane treatment sim simply refers to treatment that begins with kindness, just consideration. That's all it is. There's nothing specific about it. It is to be treated with kindness, such as to preserve the natural dignity of man. Now, the failure of authorized officers to fully recognize the access to and provision of religious services as an, as an essential service. This is during the pandemic when you could, you could call out your vet to visit your sick animal, but you couldn't call your priest or your pastor to come and attend to you during a moment of um, spiritual crisis. Many persons died in the hospital waiting on their pastor to come, but the pastor not being able to get past the protocols which imposed isolation on persons. Many of our elders died alone because they couldn't have access to the family. That kind of treatment is what you would be looking at when you are considering has a government gone too far in their breach of my constitutional rights by causing my loved one to die alone, by causing me to be deprived of the assistance or the services that are necessary for my overall well-being. And then of course we saw where some services were exempted from the um, restrictions and you would find that fast food, I remember I think um, KFC became an exempted service and you had to then consider what is it about KFC that would give it greater priority than over your own churches that were not able to operate outside of the curfew hours. I'm not going to, I think you've all, you all understand what it, the freedom from discrimination on the ground of religion, what that entails. And the best example of that probably is Miss King again, whose locks were cut off by the police in, in a manner that 
um, I think caused a great deal of upset in her Rastafarian community. Um, the right to freedom of religion is something that came under serious debate as persons sought to obtain exemptions on, on the basis of faith when they were required to take the vaccine. And you would see even how the court dodged that particular issue because it came squarely before them with a set of workers who were seeking an injunction and the court avoided dealing with that issue by saying it was a matter of contract law and the parties to the contract, that is the employment law. The court said that the parties to the contract were obliged to approach that dispute in a different way, which did not involve the constitutional court. So I thought that the judge could have been bolder in looking at the injunction because it is an issue that was squarely before them. Um, but they chose as the law permits them to, we're gonna come to that because the law does permit the court to step away from taking a decision when certain issues come to them. And we as people of faith need to know what to do when the system of man abdicates the position of leadership. Liberty of the person, that is perhaps um, one of the most important fundamental rights that we enjoy under the constitution. This liberty means that we are free to take our body anywhere. And if we are locked in, whether it is by reason of a quarantine order or because we have a stay at home or a curfew, then it puts the question of whether the, the or, or rights have been unfairly violated. I want to look not so much at what happened during the quarantine orders and the curfew hours, but I want us to consider what happens during the states of emergency and the zones of special operations. These must be examined to determine the extent to which covenant brothers and sisters are made the subject of abuse. The church must locate itself on the right side of these issues in order to remain within the will of God. And here I want to remind all of us that when slavery was the economic order of the day, first the church was a part of reinforcing and maintaining it. And then when the church saw the light, received the revelation and took a stand against it, it ultimately fell. So we, are, we must be cognizant that if the church does not find itself on the right side of these issues, they will not go away, the yoke won't be broken. And there are other human rights violations which we must consider. We look at abortion laws, we look at the laws pertaining to um, homosexuals or persons who, whose, whose behavior the Bible called detestable. Many people say to me, but the Bible says it is detestable and the Bible says you can stone various persons and adulteresses or adulterers should die. And there are many things which the Bible um, which are in the Mosaic law, which we don't observe today, but we have the, mm, we tend to pick and choose the ones that we want to, to observe in a particular way. On this point, I remind you that laws which pertain to morality require, or may I put it this way, things of the spirit are to be dealt with in the spirit. It is not for us as Christians to seek to use the punitive laws of man to resolve matters that are of a spiritual nature and matters which require us as believers to do the teaching and the training and the building up of faith that would cause persons to repent and change their behavior. So many times Pastor Percival and I are caught in this debate when callers are saying to us, that Jamaica is in a particular condition because Jamaica is not enforcing the laws. And mostly they talk about enforcing the laws which require us to um, execute persons who have been convicted of murder or enforcing various laws which would bring about the end of someone's life as opposed to the end of um, conduct which the Bible speaks against. Um, I think it is time for the church to assume its rightful position on some of these issues so that those that yoke can be broken. I'll say no more on that, but I'm happy to engage in a discussion when questions are being taken. 
the rights to security of the person and the right to freedom of thought, speech, conscience, and belief. The issue which came up on, under this particular guaranteed law is whether or not persons could be mandated to take a vaccine, which they reasonably believed was a threat to the security of their person or would violate their right to freedom of thought, speech, conscience, and belief. There were some persons who felt that the method that by which the vaccine was produced, the, the components of the vaccine were an offense to their religious beliefs, and so they did not want to take it. Thankfully, I think the level of agitation and um, resistance, which was strongly communicated to um, the leaders of this country, caused them to halt at the door of mandatory vaccination. So that is an issue yet to be resolved whether or the leaders of our country would push us in that direction. But I do want you to consider a few things which have happened recently. Um, in, recently in the House of Parliament, legislation was passed under the traffic laws, which penalizes motorists who berate transport authority workers. Um, I think they used a very old fashioned word. I'm trying to remember it, I should have written it down for this, but essentially if you curse bad words to a transport um, authority worker, you could be fined up to half a million dollars or spend six months in jail. This is just to speak words. That's it, to speak words. And um, it, it, is, it is a move in a direction which I think we all should watch because if the government begins to zip us up, zip the lips, as regards just venting, many a time the transport authorities have discourse or disputes with drivers, which may lead a driver to lose his cool and say something unpleasant. And the our parliament has passed a law which says, if you speak in a certain way to transport um, workers, authority workers, it is a criminal offense which could see you incarcerated and paying a hefty fine. The report of it was that it passed through the House without comment, save that one senator or member of parliament said that the, fee, the, the, the fine was too high. But the essential quality of it being uh, a violation of freedom of speech went right over the top. Um, and, and this is something that has happened at the hands of our own elected officials. There are a few additional considerations that I would want to bring to mind as I am wrapping up. I don't even, I wasn't monitoring the time, but Jason, you could give me a thumbs up to, to let me know if I'm still on track in my use of time. <laughs> I am watching you. <laughs> you can tell me how I'm doing with time. Um, but there are a few additional considerations that um, I want you to bear in mind. How am I doing time-wise? Okay, we have about 15 minutes uh, ah. to go with that, yes? I, I am, I'm doing okay then. Okay. Right. It remains a matter for judicial inquiry as to whether the measures that, are, that were taken during the pandemic could be said to be demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society, which invites you to consider what would be justifiable in a free and democratic society. A, demo a democratic society is one in which the citizens or the participants in decision-making are informed to the best of their ability of all the matters on which they must take a decision. Democracy implies consensus and it implies participation, people participation. Do we have that in Jamaica? It is a question for us to, to consider. And if we don't have it, then what are the steps that we ought to be taking to ensure that the citizenry has the necessary information to participate in a democracy? Democracy, of course, implies free and fair elections. That is not implies. That is a requirement that you can have free and fair elections. How do we have the foundation for that? Um, there were some specific provisions on the Disaster Risk Management Act, which citizens could have used to bring about a better, more respectful result, but very few persons utilized those provisions. 
And on that point, I just want to say that every covenant has within it the means by which you can defend it or break it or repair it. And it is necessary when we are looking at any of the rights which we are seeking to defend, that we look at the covenant to see what is the correct way that we can go about um, addressing these issues. Some of the things require legal advice. Most of them just require boldness and the use of your freedom to speak. Because even if you are mm, not wrong, but even if you are not well informed on the best way to go about a thing, just speaking about it boldly and without um, fear that you are going to be crushed by a law that says you may have to pay money for speaking. Just the ability to articulate what you are thinking and feeling can have impact. It means, therefore, that the religious community or entities that can realistically assess, uh, assess the risk associated with their activities must advocate for the least invasive restrictions that would permit you to continue the enjoyment of your rights. All, all covenants contain the key for its own survival or adaptation. And my suggestion to you is that you use them or rather we use them. Now, there, there is a general requirement throughout the constitution and every legislation that comes from the constitution for the government to be mindful of the safety and well-being of citizens. Um, this is so during, whether it is during good days or days of disaster. And specifically during times of disaster, there is a national disaster response coordination plan that the government ought to have in place that covers the entire island at all times. Under that plan, the government is to mobilize services for the protection of the public during a disaster. And they are required to regularly review and assess the disaster management activities of local groups in each parish. So for example, we have seen where houses were firebombed in, in Gregory Park, um, citizens of central Kingston, 30 of them were left homeless because of fires that took place. Sometimes they are victims of flooding in a particular area. We haven't had massive damage from earthquakes, but earthquakes that would be covered too. And when these localized disasters occur, there is a requirement on the government to do for those who are displaced the same thing that was done during COVID. And so when we see our prime minister telling a citizen who is anxious about um, her safety, the safety of our community, when our prime minister is saying that there's a lack of resources, that is not how the covenant would require us to respond. Because really there are some constitutional guarantees that protect our environment and our well-being, and citizens need to be aware of them and call on the system, let me call it that, call on the government to take care of those needs. We saw where the Ministry of Tourism or the tourism sector, education sector, agriculture, business process outsourcing, health, construction and entertainment sectors were all addressed in a manner appropriate to their economic and social activities. So it is that for the citizen, the citizen's income earning opportunity, their safety and well-being should elicit a similar level of urgent response under the constitution. Um, let me see what else I need to say to you. Now, I have to make this point because it puzzled me for a spell during the pandemic days. The church was given very scant attention. Sure, places of worship were listed amongst the places that were exempt. Um, however, employees and church personnel were not given any exemptions. And I think that the church must examine its own conscience to identify the reasons for this lack of priority. Um, the, the substitute government which came into being under the Disasterous Management Act was populated by members of every government and civil society organization. 
yet those members who sit in the pews on Sundays or Saturdays did not manifest their faith or their beliefs in the advice they gave, the positions which were taken, the laws or the regulations that were drafted. It seemed like God was absent from the room. And so as you face your parishioners, you must have that conversation concerning the lack of priority that was given to matters concerning the church. Um, some research was done by social scientists took a look at how change in government occurred in a number of African nations, which some of them had civil war, some had military um, coups effected. Um, and those they studied, they studied a number of, of African nations up to 2015 to see how the manner of change affected the constitutional arrangements or the democratic arrangements, which then ensued after the, the great change. And they came to the conclusion that when the change occurred at the urging of certain civil society organizations, there was the strongest, that was the most successful continuation of democratic processes. And the church was listed amongst those civil society organizations which can agitate for change and ensure that there is a just and pleasant result. They, they, they named trade unions, church groups, um, business groups, such as the, in our case, the um, PSOJ and the Jamaica Manufacturing Association. There are a number of what they call quotidian civil society organizations, which when they agitate for change, produce the best results. Now, this is the word of the social scientist. If they can see it, surely we as the church community must recognize that we can have impact. We have been given the authority to have impact. And when we use it, it can produce the kind of results that we desire. Um, back to the constitution. So as I said, every covenant has within it the key for its own change. Under the constitution, citizens whose rights have been violated have the right to apply to the Supreme Court for relief. However, you should know that the court may decline to exercise its power and may remit the matter to the appropriate court as happened in the case I told you about where the workers wanted to have an injunction to stop their employer from forcing them to take the vaccine. And the court said, it is an employment matter and not a constitutional law matter. And they stepped away from it and required the parties to go into um, just regular court. They did not look at it. Um, so you may find that you seek to avail yourself of the obvious remedy and the court takes a very cautious attitude. That of course is one of the reasons why there is a great need for constitutional reform because really we should have a constitutional court that sits all year round and has the resources to address matters on a timely basis and to award citizens the damages that they deserve when constitutional rights are breached. Bearing in mind that the damages they deserve is funded by the public purse. So it is at our expense that rights are breached. And if we don't guard that jealously, then we'll find ourselves constantly paying the bill. And at some point we will need to recall the persons who are so careless with the authority that we have given them. You'll find too that sometimes you take a matter to the Supreme Court for the, the constitutional court's consideration, but the issues are of such great political or social sensitivity that you are quickly hustled out of court and you do not have the opportunity for judicial review of the thing that concerns you. It means therefore that you cannot, you cannot rely entirely on what is happening in the natural realm to find your, I'm not gonna say salvation, to find your resolution. It means that we have to be equipping ourselves at all times 
with knowledge of the natural and knowledge of the spiritual, because in, in all cases, there is usually a root cause emanating from a source of power that is not necessarily the throne of God. And you have to break that covenant, which is usually of a lesser order. You have to break that in order to get to the results that you really desire. And what I have found is that when we step up to assist and to protect the rights of others, that is when the real magic happens. It's not necessarily in the court or in, or in parliament. It happens in church, in families, in communities, when we are showing ourselves to be um, bound by that higher covenant and we're giving love to each other. What should every citizen, every citizen know? Every citizen should know what are their rights. They should know that they are guaranteed the following rights freedom of movement, freedom of association and peaceful assembly, freedom of religion and from discrimination on the ground of religion, liberty of the person, freedom of thought, speech, conscience and belief, and you are entitled to receive equitable and humane treatment from the government agencies and public officials that serve you. Can the government take away your rights? The government cannot take away your rights which means whenever they do something that feels like it is a transgression against your rights, you are obliged to respond to it by seeking protection. Can your rights be lawfully suspended? Yes, your rights can be lawfully suspended if it is justified and can be shown to be justified in a free and democratic society. But always remember that any violation of your rights must be proportionate and there must be a rational connection between the measures introduced by government and the objective which is being pursued. That is why if a policeman stops you and said, I want to search your car, you are entitled to ask him why. If he cannot demonstrate that he has reason to suspect that a crime is in progress and that you are involved in criminal activity, he has absolutely no right to even enter your car or to search your person or your body. That is what proportionate means. If he is concerned that your papers may not be in order, he can ask for your papers and express that this is what he is doing. Informed consent is a crucial element of enforcing and protecting your rights. Citizens are being encouraged to consent to the violation of their guaranteed rights. Such consent, if you give it, must be based on the disclosure of all relevant information pertinent to the subject matter. The principle of informed consent is essential to the preservation of human dignity in a free and democratic society. That is why even if you happen to be incarcerated in one of our prisons, they cannot just take you and treat you like a lab rat and give you test medication on you or try out different things on you. Because even when you are being held in prison, your rights remain intact except for your freedom of movement. Now, during the pandemic, a lot of employment issues arose, but I think your knowledge of those fundamental rights should tell you that there is no employer who can cause you to be, to be hmm, who can strip you of your fundamental rights simply because they are paying you at the end of a particular season. So I think your knowledge and awareness of those fundamental rights will guide you in addressing issues which arise in your employment. Since the end of slavery, since emancipation, no person can be trapped in a relationship of employment, none. So whatever your employer does, you can always write a resignation letter and say, I quit, or you can walk off without notice. You still have that right. If you've signed a document that says you must give notice, and if you don't give notice, it's gonna cost you something, you should remember that you are bound by the contracts you sign unless you can show that that contract was arrived at without your consent by trickery or fraud, or it was arrived at in a context where you were not even aware of what you were signing to, so you didn't have full information. I'm ending rather abruptly because I'm very conscious of time and that all of you who are here have given off your personal time, as have I, but perhaps you thought I would be shorter. I did hear Pastor Jason says that some of these matters require part two. Um, I hope I haven't been too hard on your nerves, 
but I am available to take a few questions if time permits. I have to say thank you again to Pastor Jason Edwards for giving me the opportunity to share and to the various persons who assisted me in having the presentation ready. And of course, always to the Holy Spirit who gives me the greatest inspiration when to, to, to share, what to share. And of course, he gives my audience the tolerance um, to bear with me whenever I am speaking. So thank you all. I'll just remain at your disposal until Pastor Jason tells me to, to leave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wonderful. Wow, that, that's, I'm pretty glad we're recording this um so that we may have an opportunity to as any intense class uh we've had to go over the notes uh but really really uh you know comprehensive and uh, i believe you know quite timely as well uh let me kick off with a question and uh while i give the other participants um, an opportunity to just pull their thoughts together and pull on the questions that they may want clarity on or for the explanation. Uh, could you just for us, uh, Lady Minute, uh, share what, how is the, the, the Disaster Risk Management Act meant to be uh, carried out? Is there a committee? And uh, if so, how is it comprised? Because we would have had the uh, you know, Prime Minister come in and he makes the various um, decrees, as it were. Uh, there may be a better word, but give us a little bit more insight as to how that aspect of the act uh, is meant to work. All right. So the Disaster Risk Management Act operates on consultation and consensus. Yes, there was a committee. I think it had um, all of the ministries of government had representation on it. The church, all of the civil society um, organizations were represented on it. And it, it, they were parish managers and parish coordinators. And under the act, the government was required to establish stores in various parts of the island where the, necess the, the necessaries would be kept in stock, medicine, food, basic supplies, so that if a community were quarantined or isolated, the citizens would have provisions available to them. Um, they were under the... the protocols, there was a requirement for the parish managers to be in dialogue with all the civil society organizations in an area, the church, the school, um, the, the youth clubs, whatever the infrastructure in any locality, they were meant to be part of a committee and they were meant to have a communication system in place. So if you recall, I don't know if you've ever been a part of it, but during the hurricane season, sometimes they would give people a telephone and they would have a closed user group for the, those who are a part of the, the, the relief team. The same thing that they do when there is like a weather disaster event, the same things were required. And the law was pretty detailed and clear that these things ought to be in place. Um, I think um, on other, I'm, I was gonna pull up my list of the persons who were members of it. And I recall looking at the list and saying to another group that each person there must know at least one person on that list because it was a phenomenal list. That list is larger than the cabinet it's larger than, um, than the House of Parliament in terms of the number of persons who were entitled to be a part of this alternative government. So that's how it was supposed to operate. So, so just in there on the decision-making aspect of it now, so is it that the decision would be made similar to as it would be in Parliament? Um, or is it, I would imagine the Prime Minister would be the chair of that committee. The Prime Minister was the chair. The Prime right. Minister was the chair of that committee. Um, I was trying to find out if that committee ever met. I think I got as far as hearing that it may have met once. Once, okay. Yeah. But the decisions really should be from a consensus from that uh, committee. Yes. So it, it's called the National Risk Management Council. So the Disaster Risk Management Act had a provision 
which caused, called for a council to be instituted once the national disaster was declared, and it was responsible for decision-making under the chairmanship of the prime minister. It, it was comprised of a wide cross-section of persons, including chairman of the Jamaica Council of Churches. Okay. So I suppose on a matter of accountability, it would be good to, to have a review as to how was that, you know, particular requirement of law carried out in the last disaster or for any disaster for that matter? Yes, I, I think um, even as I encourage you to be bolder and more proactive in examining these issues, I think yes, especially because the tempo or the temperature has um, increased a bit or gone down a bit, whichever direction you, you you think it has moved, I think it would be a good time for the church to conduct a review on how um, their own representatives performed during this time because there, there was a representative on the council. Okay, thanks much. Okay, uh, anybody else would like to ask a question or make a comment? Well, I had one question. Um, I heard Sister Minette mention something about, for instance, uh, Jamaican, the Jamaican opting out of the current constitutional policy that is in. Um, and it, so you're saying that for us to do that, is it that? I'm oh, sorry, my fan was disturbing. So hear about that. Okay. So in order to do that, you said there, was, there would need to be some radical change. Exactly. Could you elaborate more on that? I'm just interested. That's just one point that stood out to me. All right. I missed some of the, the question was cutting in and out. Jason, did you hear enough of it to assist me? Okay. Uh, let me just ask him to just repeat as clearly as if it can be a little bit clearer, just to okay. probably save time. Am I a bit clearer now? Can you go any louder? Oh, yes, I can certainly go much louder. So go again for me, please. Sure. Okay, so I mentioned, I heard you mention something um, that was very interesting to me, like seeing, for instance, Jamaica, if it wanted to exit the current um, constitutional political government that we currently have, um, there would, be, there would need to be a radical step. There's, there's no, I guess, standard procedure of go, of doing that. Is that am I am I understanding that correctly? Um, no. Let me let me put it in in a better frame because it's important to understand. I start with the with with first the recognition that we are free to take certain steps in protection of our own self, family, society. The covenant under which we currently sit, however, is a constitution which has in it certain protocols for change. There are some entrenched provisions in the covenant which can only be changed by a certain majority of agreement or there, there's a methodology in it. If we as citizens find that our government, meaning our elected officials, are not answering our call for change, then we need to take radical steps to insist on that change taking place. What those steps are really becomes a matter of who's making the move. I referred to the research that has emanated from the social scientists, which say that if it is a civil society organization that agitates for the change, then we are more likely to have a result that suits the democratic model. This is because if you, if the changes occurred because of a revolution, of a military revolution, then a strong man emerges who is not going to behave like a democratic ruler once he has won. And that is what they were seeing in Africa. When it takes place because a political party or a guerrilla group or some kind of um, military protest is at the heart of the change, you don't end up with a democracy. They will promise to put in elections and to have a government installed and so on, but it doesn't happen in short order. However, if church groups, voluntary societies, 
business sector, private sector organizations, maybe civil servants. If the people begin the agitation, then we can catapult the situation into one of change. Whether because we have an election, we force an early election, sometimes that happens, and ministers are recalled or members of parliament are recalled, and we put the right person in place with the right mandate, and we're able to insist on accountability and so on and so forth, then you will see change taking place. But it does begin with some kind of radical shift in your understanding of what it is you want to see change in your country. Okay, maybe I should have been more specific. I was because, you know, Jamaica is considered in certain contexts uh, a sovereign country, but we know really that we're still subject to a certain level under the queen herself. So that's what's really my angle. Is it um, the like are there standard procedures for us? Because you were saying, you know, for Jamaica to become a republic, which you would, which is um, I, which I was thinking that's what we need to do, or become a kingdom. Um, well, the the key in the constitution for us to 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 shift from a parliamentary democracy to our a, a, a republic state, the key there is for a referendum for the issue to be put to the people and for the people to vote, which is a democratic process. But for the people to vote, you require them to be informed, meaning we have to teach and we have to spend time in the field consulting and educating the citizens. And depending on how that is done, the results are not guaranteed. We have seen before how government embarks on public consultation. So if you're relying on the government to do that work, then you not, you, 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 you know, you can't be confident about the result. However, if the church and the other civil society organizations step into the ring now and begin to be a part, for example, this um, presentation, which the church has organized for me to do, that is a step in the kind of direction of which I'm speaking, to get persons out there with the knowledge and the information to share it and for citizens to begin on their own to get the information and to agitate for change. That is certainly a radical shift for Jamaica. Usually we wait on the government and the leaders to do whatever they want to do. And they call an election every five years and we vote depending on how motivated we are or we don't vote, which is what happened on the last occasion. And then we live with things which may not be very pleasant for all of us. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for that question, Carl. Uh, okay, anybody else? Yes, I would just like to ask a question um, concerning the Transport Authority. It was mentioned that if a citizen or a motorist uh, use expletives to one of these persons, they will be fined up to half a million dollars. Yes. Now, what if it's the opposite where one of these persons use an expletive because of some misunderstanding and they're the ones who use it towards the motorist? What should happen to them? Well, it seems that it's a one-sided thing. It is a one-sided thing. And it's why I raised it as an example of an, an interference in freedom of expression. Freedom of expression. And um, it also is somewhat discriminatory because it only seeks to protect the government right. worker. Right. From, yes, that is why I raised it because I, I think it offends against the constitutional protection, freedom of expression. And what we are more likely going to find is that when persons are denied the opportunity to speak their feelings or to speak their heart, then it is going to overflow in an in a even more unpleasant direction. So I am watching that one too to see how the motorists, and these really are the bus drivers because Transport Authority doesn't have the jurisdiction to treat with regular motorists. They deal with persons who are operating under a license issued by the authority. So it is a very um, unique kind of protection that is being offered to a single class of government worker. And I think that it is offensive. Yeah, because people use expletives anywhere. I mean, you don't even have to be stopped by a police or out. I mean, you're just on the road walking and somebody just, just do it. I mean, something like that. 
I know, yes, it's the law concerning what is taking place, but I, I think uh, sometimes I wonder if they, if they don't have anything better to do <laughs> with certain things. And, and how, you know, just that's just my opinion. Proven, and how can it be proven that they did use the expletives? If they say it can be a he said, she said. Absolutely. Unless, of course, the transport authorities are going to be recording everything that transpires, in which case, when it comes before the judge, if it is a true recording, then the judge may, you may find that the judge is just throwing out the cases because when citizens are provoked and they speak their mind, they cannot be held to be guilty of an offense. That is my view. But I think it is, it, it's one of the things that I, I look at when I say that the Disaster Management Act was like a test case. How far can we go in, in dealing with citizens as we see a mind, as we feel a mind? And then you find that this just sailed through parliament. There was no one to oppose it except for one person who said that the fine was too high. That was a member of parliament, Michael Phillips. I've just pulled up the report. He suggested that the fine was excessive, noting that the amount should be adjusted to $300,000. So now that is a bad word. Now you understand how, how, how awful it is because if you or I spoke some unpleasant words and it resulted in getting us in before the petty sessions court, it would not be $300,000 or $500,000. And it would not be six months jail time. This would be a petty sessions matter. Yet if the same words are used to a particular class of persons, then you are subject to um, this kind of treatment. I think it Check is Parliament for those words at times. <laughs> yes, I believe <laughs> that has been. I believe there was a recording of the, of one of those words being used in part. Man, it's there. Okay, and also you know I've, I think I remember hearing a lot being used against the prime minister as well in recording. Yes. yes. Um, so you know, but, but what can we do at this point? Considering that, you know, this may be just a precursor to, you know, other ulterior motives. Um, what well, can we do? There, there is always time for persons to begin the, the discussion or a conversation in, in the public space. Or you wait for someone to be charged under one of those pieces of legislation. And you put your weight behind making a constitutional challenge. Now, that's not one which they can brush aside and say it's employment law, because that is, that is a straight constitutional matter, because it is a piece of legislation which seeks to impose some special discriminatory condition on the, on the freedom of speech. So it, 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 we test it either in the court of law or in the court of public opinion, but it needs to be tested. I certainly will keep speaking about it um, on the various platforms to which I have access, just to see if at some point um, it can rise to an even higher level of consideration because just as the laws are made, laws can be repealed. And sometimes that is what will bring people out to vote, to change the government so that the laws can be addressed in, in a professional and um, a more righteous and equitable way. Yes, the legislation states that the use of abusive or calumnious language to an inspector in the carrying out of the inspector's duties would attract a fine or imprisonment. And calumnious language is just a fancy way of saying that they call your reputation into, into um, question. Hmm. Wow. Well, uh, thanks so much for, for, for that. That certainly raised some amount of, you know, questions as to what is it that we are allowing um, and what is it that we want to continue to allow. Uh, you know, the church, uh, those who may be listening may say, wow, this is, this is so big and so beyond me. What can I do to make a difference? Um, but certainly there are things we can do to make a difference, to enact change and to bring about transformation. Um, I suppose the first thing is really that you came here and you, you, know, you, you, you came to listen and to learn. So allow 
me to ask persons to just give some comments um, as to what you have heard. How has it been for you? Is it something you'd like to hear more of? Um, how useful has it been? How has the presentation been for you? If I could have some feedback from that. Good evening. Uh, um, good evening. I'm just, I'm just, okay. Um, all right. I'm just curious to know what happened to the the um the peaceful demonstration thing. Where the there's a feedback. Are you hearing me? Yes, I am. Okay. The peaceful demonstration where the there was this arrest in Kingston when they were having that peaceful demonstration and. We have heard what was the outcome of the peaceful demonstration of that. I can't remember his name, but he, I think he, the head of the party, the head of yeah, that Mr. group. Mr. Patterson. Patterson, yes. What yes. happened? Yes. So, I mean, if, if, if one is going to be arrested or a group is going to be arrested because they're peacefully demonstrating, how, how does that stand for the citizens? I mean... So... So here again, we see how state power is used um, to interfere with um, constitutional rights and freedoms. He was arrested because it was said that he did not seek to get a permit for use of the public um, street space to mount his protest. Now, a permit, if you plan a protest, and you are likely to interfere with the free movement of other citizens in the public space, then you are required to apply for a permit and the police would assist you in maintaining order so that persons who are not a part of the protest can um, navigate the spaces freely. Okay. Now, that is the heart of how constitutional rights are are addressed because you are free to enjoy your right, but not at the expense of another person who is seeking to enjoy their right to freedom of movement. Um, and so that's the basis on which he was arrested on two grounds, no permit. And the second was that the COVID protocols under the Disaster Risk Management Act prevented congregation of persons over and above a certain number. The case has been adjourned and adjourned and adjourned and has not come to any conclusion. And more likely than not, at some point will be dismissed because um, one of the things that we seem to lack the courage to do is to, on government side, we make a big deal of, of arresting persons and then we are not quick to bring the matter to our resolution so citizens can examine the, 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 the fairness of, of what it is that we have done. So I have spoken to Mr. Patterson on the matter um, probably about a month or two ago, and it, is, it has not been resolved in the courts as yet. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So that, thanks for that, uh, Sajin. I know, Robert, you had a question you wanted to ask and then yes. you're after. first of all i want to come in the presentation it was long but it was very interesting and um i i think that the time that we have um allocated might have been underestimated because um she went, it was so comprehensive and I, I took notes at some point I had to stop because <laughs> I, I was in danger of missing what was being said, right? So I had to stop and just listen. So naturally I couldn't process everything. But there's one thing that I, that came into my mind though. Um, first of all, the distinction between the church and the body of Christ. Are they the same? And if, if, if not, then why are we as a, I mean, the church is just an interest group, right? That um, has to fight for the, the, the ideas, struggle for their ideas to be adopted by the government that has been, and we, we, we say the government, all governments are established by God, right? And it is for us to 
you know, with basic, basically to have a peaceful society and mm -hmm. to, to live in peace so that we can um, practice our, our religion. But mm -hmm. there comes a time when we are, we could be um, overly, uh, what to say, either um, so enthusiastic and so convinced that we are right um, that we ignore the fact that the government was elected democratically, that we have to contend with um, ideas from various groups, and that we as a church uh, might be advocating something that really, if the church and the body of Christ is not the same, then maybe even though the body of Christ supposed to, I mean, would be, um, in other words, taking all our um, instructions then from, from the word of God, that there are some things that we have to allow in the interest of peace in the society. I don't know, it's a very long uh, dissertation, but I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. I do. May I, may I, may I, may I just add, um, not to be uh, uh, an angel's advocate or anything, but that there was um, there were quite a few churchmen who agreed and who came on the air um, encouraging their congregations and others to comply yeah. with this statement. So there may be disagreement even among those who are called the church in that yeah. there may be differences of opinion. Yes. This might, of course, be fueled by lack of knowledge, but yeah. let us assume otherwise. But I think I think it is a brilliant point that is worthy of the time that you took to, to share with me and that I took to present because there is always that, that tension between how we are perceived by government authorities or in the natural, in the world of man and who we really are. So when you speak about the difference between the church and the body of Christ, in the natural world, under the legislation, the church was recognized as the representative of okay. a body created under some government statute. So there is a Jamaica Council of Churches and whomever heads that organization is whom the government sees as the church. Now, it doesn't matter if that person truly reflects the opinion or the consensus of a unified church. And it, it doesn't even matter. It, it is the government that determines how, how this body is constituted because it is a creature of government's imagination. It's not that the church came together on its own and said, this is my representative. So you are very right that there is a distinction to be made between what the world of man says is the church and recognizes as the church and who we really are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there's a, a move to you know, replace the Jamaica Council of Churches with the umbrella group of churches um, or something to that effect to, to, for a true representation or reflection of the church as the church itself sees itself. And I mean, there's a legislative utensil that is required to do that. And I believe we, if it is so, then it's something that we, we need to follow up on uh, with some amount of immediacy. Yes. It does it need to be replaced or need to go alongside? Well, I suppose that would be part of the, 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 the deliberation. Uh, but at present, the umbrella group of churches includes, if I'm not mistaken, the JCC plus other, uh, you know, denomination bodies. Because the JCC is specific to a certain... Uh, I guess the traditional um, churches, but don't quote me on that. But I believe that's that's how it's presently constituted. Hence, the, the 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 umbrella group of churches they actually do meet and have discussions and really, you know, back to the prime minister. But on the protocols and I suppose in in law 
or in our constitution, it's the JCC that is still there. Yeah. But couldn't, sorry. Um, could, could I uh, continue? Uh, um, I have another question there. Sure. Sure, go ahead. Yes. So couldn't um, there be, there needs not be any contention between both because the umbrella group of churches, you would, would have no, um, I presume would have no restrictions you know, um, because it's an umbrella. You're welcoming everybody. The JCC is, is, is that body that is recognized by the government. So if the, the, the JCC is the official, um, you would call representative of, of that of the group of, of Christians in Jamaica, then um, the, the issue that we have it, since we are recognizing that we have an, a representative, just like oh, we would have a union leader, this, this, it should not, it's, the talk should not be between government and the umbrella group of churches or, you know, and content as, a, as another group. It should be within the church. It, it should be within those who are officially represented by the government and those who, and, and the umbrella group of churches. In other words, the discussion should be contention should be within that body so that the, 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 the representative, just like how your representative can just go put his opinion or her opinion, but has to um, be mindful of the, the, the you know, plethora of, discourse, of, of, of ideas under its body and then come to some, what you call it now, some, um, some agreement as to what truly represents the the, the group of Christians in Jamaica. Um, I replace yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm confusing people about the body of Christ. I know. <laughs> <laughs> if I may, um, I think this warrants, uh, requires us perhaps at an, another session like this where we invite the, the, the leaders or some representative from, you know, whether the umbrella group of churches or the JCC to come and share because really we are, you know, they're parishioners and uh, there should be that opportunity available. So um, if that is something along that- uh, with, Along with our, our erstwhile lawyer. Pardon? <laughs> in, in the company of our... Oh, uh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, but, Allow me to allow me to allow uh, Marsha Blago. She had her hand up for, uh, for some time. Forgive me, Marsha. Um, let me just hear your question or your comment as we sure. seek to be wrapping up. Great evening, everyone. I greet you all in the mighty name of Jesus. Um, great presentation, Madam Minette Lawrence. I I was really just engulfed in the knowledge and the wisdom that you have dispensed on us this evening. Um, just a few, I would say, observation or, you know, I wanted to just, after listening and, you know, the first thing is that um, I've been to a few churches since the pandemic. One of the things I've observed is that the, and as I said, it's a personal um observation that the kind of tenacity into worship that they that um persons normally have in churches i mean you just go to church you go with a praise you go with a worship i find it's kind of lacking and i personally wanted to blame it on these lockdowns and these zooms that we were so restricted to in the sense of persons just sitting before their phones not, I mean, I have to be told, I mean, that, hello, um, th that kind of worship that we're used to. I, and, and the reason why I'm saying this is I've, I've, I saw, I saw a, a meme or a picture of a donkey or an horse being tied to a plastic chair. And while that horse was tied to that plastic chair, he didn't move. And I, I mean, the moral of it is that Look at a horse to a plastic chair. If he's, he, 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 it's, it's the state of mind that yeah. he's in because he's able, I mean, the chair is nothing for a horse to pull, but because he has been tied there for so long, he has become adopted. And so I find that these lockdowns and these restrictions where, I mean, 
it, it, you spoke earlier of covenants and you mm-hmm. you spoke of of freedom of religion and all that and i believe as i heard the, the um the mr roberts spoke about you know um no, more than who pardon right i heard earlier on he spoke about you know just the 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 the, the, the church umbrella groups right the churches um were they really standing up i mean we were in a situation where we needed more prayer, we needed more church group, we needed more togetherness. Like, I mean, as you know, I mean, I'm in the health sector, and as Sister Minette said, several persons died without their family or their priests or their pastors being able to even bless them or just give them a word of prayer or encouragement. So, is it now a situation where the powers that be or the, the, the religious groups? or it's that we're supposed to be saying, listen, now is the time that we need persons to be praising, to be worshiping. Instead, we were shut down. We, our mouths were literally shut during these times. I mean, some of our mouths were literally shut during but, these times. Yeah, I do hear, I do hear you, Sister Marsha, and thank you for the kind words, but you are pointing to the fact that real damage was done. And the effect of that damage might be felt for years to come, because in recent times too, we have seen a number of persons even questioning the effectiveness of prayer. When the prime minister says divine intervention is needed, some people are saying, what for? And it has really done a a rough job on the psyche and the mentality of those who serve. So I do, I I take your point and and it's, it's very well made. There was real harm, real harm. So thank you for your no, who is you. responsible? Yes. Thank you so much for that contribution, uh, Marsha. Uh, really, I believe we all are so somewhat, you know, suffering from that lack of you know, togetherness and uh, fellowship and worship during that time. And what we're recognizing is that something went through the gate and we were not in a position to address it appropriately. And uh, this is, I would like to believe, a move now to ensure that it doesn't happen again. And uh, we want to really thank, you know, as we seek to be closing our sister minute, uh, lady minute, madame minute, you know, uh, council, uh, I just allow you, sister, just give you a closing remarks and then, you know, we seek to close out this because we don't want to, uh, we want to leave enough for part two. <laughs> yes. Well, um, both the comments and, and the questions were on point and well appreciated. And I think it is a very good start that we begin to examine these things closely. And I, for one, um, I'm very pleased to have been able to contribute because I know that it takes a lot of industry to bring the information together and to communicate it in a way that is relatable. It's why I said it's a contemporary view of these principles through, um, you know, I would say modern day eyes. Um, A number of persons get stuck in their revelation and they are unable to translate some of these um, old principles of the kingdom into a fresh reality that can guide in decision making. I'm struck by the point made by, um, I think it was Mr. Finlayson or um, Robert, I think, that there is a difference between the body of Christ and the church. Um, And it is a matter for the church to examine itself closely and ensure that what it is recognizing as being its own critical identity is what is in the public's eye. It's what people see and can relate to. If we are, if there are two churches and like the two Jamaica, you may find that the wrong one is speaking on, on issues that are fundamental to faith and to freedom and to the manifestation of the kingdom of God. So um, thank you again. And of course, I know Pastor Jason will let me know if he requires me for another session. Absolutely. And I can let you know from now. Yes, we do. We will. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's been a wonderful evening. I want to thank you so much for all those who came, took the time out to participate, and just to listen and to learn. I believe this is a part of the, mature, the, the, the maturing church, and uh, God is still in control, and uh, he is equipping his body for the works of the ministry to serve and to bring the transformation that we need. Uh, so thank you so much again, uh, Lady Minute, and we are so blessed to have you at being a member and a part of the body at this time and for such a time as this. I'm going to ask Elder Duvall, uh, they say one good turn deserves another, and uh, you started us off in an opening prayer. Do you, would you be so kind to send us off in closing prayer or the benediction? Okay, Doc, uh, we're not hearing you. I suppose there may be some challenges there. Okay. Uh, not hearing me? Yes, we're hearing you now. Stay right there. Don't move. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that there, there, there are other points of view that we might need to invite to the table to make our discussion seem um, balanced. In, uh, or in other words, that anyone listening on the outside will not say that you guys are pandering to yourselves and to your own ideas rather than allowing all the voices to be heard. For instance, one might say that um, most churches developed uh, an online ministry that didn't have it before. And I didn't, I, I, I'm very fearful of people thinking that God was caught by surprise. And I think that we need to give him all the praise that he has led the, the things, he has allowed things to go. So that even when we open our eyes to injustices, it is of, of his doing. You know, we're not because we're so smart. He has opened our eyes to the dangers that, that might overtake us. And of course, it, um, he has prepared people with the knowledge and the ability to save us further trauma. But at the same time, let us thank God for the for, 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 for the, the things that He has done to cause us to progress, even in times of hardship, when it looked like our way was that. Oh, the many people who um, had left the island and couldn't come home could um, uh, uh, fellowship with us, and even in this time, Sister Pet know how to use the, the system. Isn't that amazing? Uh, yeah, she is, she, she is far advanced. So we thank God. And in, in, in a way, we would not even have made contact with our, our resident legal advisor. Uh, you know, we were taking, we're taking um, the liberty of calling her ours. Our resident legal advisor. And uh, now, as we go ahead, our way will be much more clear and when we are approached otherwise, guess who we're going to stop by the police. I'll stop by the police. <laughs> guess who? You know, they are now even saying that if you put bright lights on the front of your car, they can, uh, you can report the people. I mean, you know, people like me who don't sit too well, uh, they don't take kindly to that. But anyway, let us thank God that, you know, our, 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 our appetites have been whetted, our eyes have been opened. And our ears are to the ground. Let us continue to be vigilant because God demands it of us as watchmen that we watch and we cry out for us. We, it will be called. We, we, we will be, yes, the ones who. Thank you, madam. Thank you. You have been a blessing. And um, we, should, we are sure that God will lead you in your way. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace towards us and to your people. We thank you for those who delayed uh, eating so that they could be fed. And Father, never we pray that even at this time, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. And those who hunger also will get adequate amounts because you have promised. Father, never we pray your blessing upon all those here in the name of Jesus. 
Amen. Amen. Ah, may, the one, may the one who makes the crocus burst into bloom, may the one who makes the lame come by taste uh, colored, may the one who makes the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue short for joy, grant you the power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge in Jesus' name. Bless you all and may the Amen. grace of God go with you. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. See you next Thank time. You for having Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings to all. Amen. Go in grace.